Hi, this is Janine Miller, and you are watching Pieces of Victory. Today, we have on our show Teresa and Ashley Tucker, mother and daughter that were subjected to child abuse within the troubled teen industry. Ashley was tortured beyond belief inside this camp. Teresa, a mother, was most vulnerable. Her daughter, addicted to substance, cried out for help and was led by her pastor to this residential program that was highly abusive. It was supposed to be a safe haven to help fix broken families, to help mend a relationship. And yet it was nothing of the sort. Today, both are activists amongst the survival community. In fact, they are creating a Facebook page to help survivors and parents that are contemplating sending their children to one of these programs. Please welcome to the show, Teresa and Ashley Tucker. Hi, Ashley. How are you doing today? Welcome Hi. to the show. Hi, how are you? Hi, nice to see you. Welcome to the show, Pieces of Victory. It is so nice for you to be here to tell your story about what happened to you in a lockdown residential program located in Missouri called the Circle of Hope Girls Ranch. Do you want to start from the beginning of maybe your childhood before you got locked up into this reform school? What what exactly happened? Can you tell us? Yes. Um, when I was younger, I was raised in a single household. Um, when I hit my teenage years, I was really big on basketball. I would, I was starting varsity as a freshman. Um, I had scholarships lined up. I was doing really good. And then I got really bad into drugs. Um, I was smoking weed, uh, doing coke and also meth, smoking cigarettes. Um, I was sneaking out at night, um, partying, just basically going an opposite way. Uh, my mom being a single mom, she wasn't, she didn't really know what to do. She tried her hardest. Um, I was put in psychiatric homes. I was put in um, two different ones. And Circle of Hope was kind of a last resort uh, because she honestly like didn't want me to end up dead on the side of the road somewhere. So she sent me to Circle of Hope. Were you trying to escape with the drugs? What, what was going on? Were you self-medicating? What was happening? I was self-medicating, I was taking pills, um, I was smoking weed, meth, coke. I just, I had a lot of anger growing up. Okay. Um, watching my mom and my dad, um, their abusive relationship when I was younger. Um, watching my mom struggle growing up. Um, we didn't always get, you know, the new clothes. and <laughs> She tried her hardest, but, you know, she was by herself. So I just... I just had a lot of anger built up. I mean, my grandma died when I was 11. Um, so, yeah, just a lot of anger as a kid built up. How many other siblings did you have? Uh, I have a little brother, and I have an older sister. Little brother, older sister, very tough, being a single mom and pulling all the weight. Um, did you feel neglected? I mean, as painful as that is to say, did you feel alone a lot? Um, were you depressed because of that, or...? Uh, she worked all the time to be able to pay bills. So um, when we got old enough, we stayed here by ourselves. Or when we were younger, we stayed with my aunt. Uh, so, yeah, it was a lot of, I felt like I was alone. I felt like, you know, she was trying her hardest, but um, there was only thing she could do as a single mom. Um, growing up, she was always really strict. You know, like, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. So when I started getting angry and, you know, becoming a teenager is when every time she told me I couldn't do something, I did it just to show her that I could do it. Right. A typical teenage rebellion. And then you started reaching to self-medicate with drugs as an escape. Was it um, friends too? I mean, did you feel that you needed to impress your friends, fit in, or did it have nothing to do with peer pressure and just merely an escape? It, the peer pressure, it was more of, um, just my childhood in gen general, um, having to deal with everything that I had to deal with growing up, I just needed an escape. And 
being able to be high was pretty much my escape. It was a time where I was actually able to breathe. Um, I had anxiety. I had depression. Uh, I had bipolar. Um, I was diagnosed with all different kind of um, different things. So it was mainly just to be able to get away. Were you taking medication? I know that's a little personal. Were you taking medication for the bipolar or? Yes, I took uh, different medications. Um, I wasn't able to stay on them for very long due to um, whenever I took them, I felt nothing. Like I literally had no feelings. Okay. It's like an out of body experience basically like I was there but I wasn't there things that you would normally laugh at I would not laugh things that you would normally cry about didn't bother me uh when I was upset I just I mean I had no emotions and it was it was scary <laughs> so uh like you were a mindless droid um, pretty much <laughs> medication you know I'm not frowning on medication when it comes to helping someone with depression and you know, bipolar mania, um, but the side effects, I can see the side effects. And today um, with CBD oil, that is actually helpful, but you were just trying to self-medicate, but then you, it, you also dabbled into other drugs that were hardcore as well. Yeah. Um, the meth and coke were really addicting. It was always trying to find that next high, trying to find a better high. Oh, no. um, weed for a while it takes a lot more to be able to get high uh once you start doing coke the first couple times is great and then after a while it's just trying to get higher than what you were um or to actually be able to create that first high uh meth was pretty much the same thing um the medications pain pills uh, i tried all of those i was just basically trying to find that first high that first actual sense of relief and it I, I couldn't find it so i just kept on and kept on and kept on no oh, and so you're spinning out of control mom notices and you knew right away she was using drugs or i didn't know right away um there was one day that she came home and she was high and so um i took her to the police department here in the county and they um didn't they didn't help me none so um, they told me I could take her home, and, or I could, um, if I took her on the street, then I would, they, would take her home, they would make me take her home, plus have a fine as well. So he said, my, my best bet is just to take her home. And, and any I, rehabilitation? Did you ever go to rehab? Or? I, I took her to Hickory Falls, and I took her to Green Oaks, but that just kind of put her in the same environment as them, and it made her have more contacts. It didn't help her at all. So it made it worse. Made and it worse. I'm a little ignorant when it comes to, to drugs, but I do know that once someone is hooked on, it is it just takes over. And it's okay. they're out of control and it and they need help, professional help. And unfortunately there's there was no help at the Circle Pope Girls Ranch, but you didn't know that. Let's talk to the audience about this so-called place that was supposed to help you and and you had no other recourse you felt um you were at your wits end you've tried just about everything like you right. said rehabilitation was just an open door to more contacts and making the situation worse what happened next um she ran away one day uh we were on we were fixing to go to a christmas party got in the car and she took off so I called the police here where we live and um, they came and got her and they took her to Green Oaks at that point. Within not even hours, Green Oaks was calling me, telling me I needed to uh, come pick her up, that she didn't belong here. What? Yeah. So I said, no, you'll have to keep her. You're supposed to keep her 72 hours. And they told me um, pretty much, no, um, a smart mouth and she needs, to, she needs to be gone. There's other people that need this facility. So... The next morning, it was a Sunday, I went and picked her up. And when I picked her up, well, I went to church first and spoke with my pastor's wife. And I was just crushed. Oh. Are you okay? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Come in. You're fine. If so. It's okay. She talked to my pastor and my pastor's wife. Uh, they had recommended Circle of Hope because they took a trip to Agape 
Um, and they weren't aware of the abuse. They had no clue what was going on. They just heard good things about Circle of Hope. So they told my mom that they would come pick me up. I was to stay at their house that night. And then they were going to contact them as well, get all the paperwork, fill it all out. And since she was a single mom with three kids having to work, um, they were going to take me up there so she could go to work so she didn't have to miss out on bills. Um, when I arrived at Circle of Hope, it was that it was it was around dinner time. Uh, I mean, they were outside the door like waiting for me when I got there. Uh, we they greeted us. They were very friendly. They were you know smiling and laughing. I mean, go happy and just they I just I don't know, just very excited. It was kind of weird. Um, whenever we went inside their office, it was me, my pastor, my pastor's wife, Mrs. They were gonna they were telling me how I was gonna be able to get counseling, how they were gonna help me get off the drugs, how they were going to um basically make me a better person, um help me with my schooling and make sure I was to graduate school because I had dropped out due to being on drugs and not attending school that much. My mom was actually going to go to court for truancy. So she had to take me out of school. Um, so they were going to try to get me caught back up in school. It's basically just, this was this was like amazing place. Um, once my pastor and his wife left, and like as soon as the door closed, I mean, it was just completely different. I mean, their smiles went away. And it was just seriousness. And I remember meeting my guide. I just looked at her. It was just like sadness just written all over her face. And she's trying so hard to just make this place look, you know, like it was amazing. But you could tell. Um, whenever I walked into the kitchen area, um, I mean, all the girls were sitting down eating dinner. And it was just, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody like each other. Uh, we were only allowed to talk to the staff or Brother House and Miss Steph. It was just quiet and just depressed. And, like, whenever, like, you, like, walked in and, like, the first smell that hit you was just, like, it was, like, sour milk and pee. Like, it, it was disgusting. Like, it was, a, it was a horrible smell. That's what another survivor said. They said that the smell, it smelled sour in this place. And it was a distinct smell that they just cannot shake. And I, I've been hearing that a lot. After that, uh, they had all my stuff. Um, they stated to me that I would get my stuff in the morning time. And they told me to um, just have a seat. And then they asked me if I ate. I told them I'd already ate before I got there. So they didn't give me food that night. Um, we went to bed. I had on the clothes that I wore when I got there. They didn't even give my pajamas to change into. Uh, the next day when I woke up, they didn't even give me any of my clothes. <laughs> All the clothes that I had brought, like my underwear, my bras, my socks, um, everything that I got, I didn't get any of it. I had to go wow. next door to the, there was a brick house. We went next door, went up the stairs where it was like uh, this like big storage area. And that's where they got me panties and bras and socks. And, like, they were they were used. They were not brand new. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was disgusting. Like that I was disgusting. I, in my head, I was thinking, like, like what? Like, I was so confused. And um, the first week there, uh, you have your guide. So you don't really get in trouble. So, um, like, I never really got in trouble in the first week because we were still learning the rules. But, I mean, after the first week, if you did anything wrong, like, uh, you asked a question that you weren't supposed to ask. Or, like, you asked for the smallest thing, like, may I please go get a cup of water? And, like, they didn't want you to. They would, like, push. Which is basically, you get in push-up position, you do ten push-ups, and then you ask, may I please get up? You had to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, and if... You didn't say that. You had to do push-ups. So let me get this straight. If you wanted a glass of water or to go to the bathroom, they were giving you push-ups for that. I I'm sorry, I wasn't understanding that. Uh, you had to ask to get water, and you the bathroom breaks. We were only allowed two bathroom breaks a day. 
for one day we bathroom breaks. That's it. What year were you in in this camp? 2014 to 2015. 2014 to 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay, normally um, girls are in here for two years. You were in there for one. Is that because mom took you out early? I was there for three months. Um, I was slowly and surely trying to get the red flags to my mother that this was not a good place. Okay. I was trying very hard. Uh, the letters, I would try to write in letters, but they would make me read write my letters uh they told me that that was not the truth and it was the truth it just wasn't their truth exactly Censor they were censoring the letters and then making you rewrite actually lies when you think about it and this is supposed to be a christian institution and they're lying oh yeah they were definitely <laughs> lying um we were supposed to get phone calls after so like the first 30 days that you're there you're not allowed a phone call you're not allowed to write a letter you're not allowed to speak to your parents. You're not allowed to do schoolwork. The only thing we did was uh, stand against the wall, shake butter, or we would do chores. Like, we would clean. But it's not like a normal cleaning that you would do at your house or, like, at my house. We had, a dr like, a dry rag, and it was, like, some nasty little rag. And we would stay in one spot, like, one little area, and we would wipe it down for hours. This one little bitty spot. So we had to do stuff like that, or uh, like chores. One little, let me get this straight. You're wiping down one spot with a dirty rag. Are you even wringing it out in clean water? No, there's no water. You don't get any what? water. You're not getting any spray. It's a dry rag. I wanted to get that straight for the audience because that is crazy. And what is the purpose of that? That's not I even... I it clean. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. So they're designating when you can go to the bathroom and when you cannot. That is child abuse. You cannot do that in a home, in an institution, period, to a child. A child should be able to go to the restroom whenever they want. And it's horrifying to know that this place is still open today. There was a girl that um, she was sitting in a chair and she wasn't looking forward. She just kept looking to the side. And brother just kept telling her, look forward. Don't look at the other girls. You need to look forward. We were eating. No, we had just got finished eating dinner. And when, uh, everybody was working on their, like, school, uh, like, their school paces. And it was still in my first 30 days, so I couldn't do school paces. So I was actually reading my Bible. Like, during their free time, it's you sit down and do your schoolwork or you read your Bible. There was no, like, watching TV or, like, playing a game or just having some time to yourself like you like had to be forced to read the bible or forced to do schoolwork well this girl she wasn't she just kept looking like around she wasn't looking down at what she was doing so brother actually went and got a neck brace like you know when you break your neck in like one of those neck braces he brought it out of his office he put it around her neck and tightened it as tight as he possibly could so she would keep her head like straight and she kept telling him, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And he was just like, you need to look forward. Like, I was like, oh my gosh. And let me ask you this question. I understand that mom was going to church. Were you a strong Christian before going into this lockdown place? Yes. Yeah. Growing up, we went to church um, every Sunday. Um, we didn't really know it's because she was working. But yeah, we went to church. Relationship with God. Yes? Yes. Okay. And when you were thrown into this place, not any fault of yours, uh, but the pastor of your church recommended this place and you thought this was going to be a safe haven and it turned out to be a nightmare. What was going on in your mind as a Christian young girl going into this program? What were you thinking? I was terrified the whole time I was there. I was... Um I was scared. I mean, because they always told me, you're going to be here till you're 18 years old. And I'm only 16 at the time. So, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, I have two years of this. Oh and God. this is not what a Christian does. This is not Christianity. Like, this is, like, this is a cover for them to abuse you, basically. It's really demonic. I'm just going to say it like it is. This, these places are demonic. When you are lying and not telling the truth, when you're 
telling kids to write incident reports, and we'll get into that in a minute, that aren't true. Um, and when ch children cannot voice the truth, they're being deceitful. They're deceitful. They're flat out liars. Um, it's demonic. And the judgment that went on to uh, was and making girls feel that they didn't belong into society and to God is dark. They had restraining when you were there. Yes, I was actually restrained. Um, so in our living quarters, well, living quarters, sorry. Uh, there was two stories. Um, and we would go, I was, we were upstairs and we were cleaning and I was wiping down this one little wall with this dirty rag for like two hours. Unbelievable. Uh, they didn't like the way I was cleaning. So they put me in push-up position for oh three God. hours. Oh my God. <laughs> they didn't like the way I was cleaning. They said I wasn't doing it right. I don't understand that either. But they put me in push-up position for three hours. And I mean, like, that's in, like, you have to literally get into push-up position and stay there. You cannot fall. You cannot uh, drop. I mean, you have to be perfect push-up position. I was there for three hours. After three hours, I finally fell because my, my arms were weak. I was, um, I could barely, like, hold myself up anymore. So I finally fell. Well, he picked me up from my shoulders and stood me straight up. He got into my face and his forehead was pressed against mine, like as hard as he could. And he's screaming at me at the top of his lungs. Oh and he's God. telling me that I'm being rebellious, that I'm wicked, that I'm not listening to them and I'm not doing anything right and I'm nothing and I'm always going to be nothing. And I mean, just saying all these horrible things to me. And as he's like talking to me, he's spitting in my face. And that's disgusting. So I was trying to back away from him, like walk backwards. And it finally got to the point where I was, I finally hit a wall. And when I hit the wall, it was like my, it was the wall and then it was my head and then it was his head. He was still pushing against my head, like still pushing on my forehead against my head and also against the wall, still screaming, still yelling and like still spitting in my face. Oh my God. Yeah, and then I was like, um, and you're also vulnerable from doing all the pick, uh, the push ups. Your body is fatigued, so of course, you're going to fall back. You're trying to hold yourself up because you're fatigued, right? So, finally, like, you know what? Uh, he was still screaming at me. He asked me, or he kept asking me, Do you understand? Well, I said, Yes, sir, because you know, whenever they ask you, Do you understand? or they ask you something, you have to say, Yes, sir. So, I was just like, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he was like, don't say nothing. Don't say anything. And I was like, yes, sir. And he's like, I said, don't say nothing. So I didn't say anything. He's like, do you understand me? Well, I didn't say yes, sir, because he told me not to. Right. And he said, now you're being rebellious. So he grabbed me, threw me to the floor. I hit my face on the ground. Oh my God. He put his knee into the back of my head on a pressure point right here, his knee. And was pressing down as hard as he could. He had his arms on my shoulders, pushing me down on pressure points. Oh, and he girls brain her. I had a girl on this arm on my pressure points, this arm on my pressure points, on both my legs. And um, one of the staff members, they had my ankles. And they were holding my ankles, and they were pushing my ankles in, like trying to break my ankles. Oh, my and God. The whole hour. That's awful. That's torturous. Especially after being so fatigued, like I said, from doing the push-ups. But regardless of that, what they're doing is torturous. Let's talk about Frederick Cornelius. Frederick Cornelius is a 16-year-old little boy. And he had post-traumatic stress disorder. And what they did was they restrained him. And they restrained him to the point of death. And this place is still open today, abusing little girls. And with COVID-19... Who's to say if this guy isn't, isn't screaming in girls' faces up close and personal? These right. people are crazy. Who knows what's going on? I'm sure it's still open right now during COVID, correct? Yes. Yes. So who knows what's going on? I mean, I'm speculating on that. But if he's crazy before COVID, what makes you think he's not crazy during COVID? Right. Um, at any rate, what happened next? You, so, you, after they restrained me for an hour, brother told me to get back in push-up position. At this point, my arms and my whole... I felt paralyzed. I couldn't move. 
I was trying so hard to get up, but every little movement that you would feel like to just lift your arm up, I couldn't do that. My little movements were like barely moving my hand. That was a big movement to me. And I was trying to get feeling back into my body. And he's still screaming at me, do the push position, do the push up position. And I was just like, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I'm crying and I'm so upset and I'm trying so hard to get. And he just like kept screaming. And then finally he was like, you know what? You're being rebellious. You're not listening. So they restrained me again. They got back on me and for a second time, for an hour, doing the exact same thing, trying to break my ankles. His knee was in the back of my head, my shoulders being pushed completely, like all over again for a whole other hour. Oh my God. Because yeah, I couldn't. Like you're first. damned if you do and damned if you don't. These um, people are nuts. They're playing head games. They're torturing little kids. And they're getting away with it. They're getting away with it. And this place is still open today. I'm going to say that as often as I can during, during this interview because I'm disgusted. You are my seventh survivor that I interviewed alone, alone from the Circle of Hope Girls Ranch. That's like the stuff that they tell our parents, like that's what actually happened. Okay. They sent a report and told my mother that two girls were talking about me and that I attacked them. So they didn't have a choice, but to restrain me. That one was what was said to her. And that was not even what happened. It was crazy. So I understand they're having girls incident reports cover their butts on bruises or any repercussions. Did they have you fill out one or? Yes, I had to fill out two incident reports while I was uh, The first one was, I was, um, after the restraining happened, I was an orange shirt, because they had different color shirts. They had an orange, they had yellow, uh, pink, green, red, blue, and then black was the lowest, and then they had a neon shirt, which was suicide, like suicide watcher, like you're going to run away or something. So after I was in an orange shirt when I got there, I was still in an orange shirt when this happened. Well, they took me to, um, they told me to come to the office. Like they went downstairs, I finished cleaning, and then they sent one of the girls to tell me to come to the office. I went to the office, and as I was walking inside the office, I said this word. I don't know what it was. It sounded like foreign, but he said it really, like he mumbled it. And when he mumbled it, they had a German shepherd. It was a dog. And I think her name was like Dutcher, Duchess, something like that. Well, whenever they said that word, the dog started growling and it came up and it bit my leg. Oh no. Dog attached to my leg and I was trying not to fall because I was scared if I fell to the ground, the dog would completely attack me. Oh so my I'm God. up against the wall and I'm crying and I'm like screaming because it hurts so bad. And I'm like, please, please get it off, get it off, get it off, get it off. Sorry, but our dog doesn't like wicked little girls that like to be restrained. Oh, that was what? Oh. So basically, the owner's wife said the dog's name pretty much to attack you. Yes. It was almost like a command to attack. And then yes. said that you were a wicked little girl. All yeah, in the name but of Jesus, okay? Um, I'm so disgusted with with people trying to claim Christianity and they're abusing kids. It's making me sick. Shut this place down. Really, the emotional abuse alone could shut this, should shut this place down. Then what happened after the dog? Did they make you sign an incident report? Tell us well, about that. Was they um, took my orange shirt away from me. They gave me a black shirt. So after they had attacked my dog. Huh? Which is, let's tell the audience, the black shirt is worse than an orange shirt. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, the orange shirt is better than a black shirt. But they gave me a black shirt after they restrained me and after I got bit by a dog. For, oh God. for nothing. Yeah, for nothing. <laughs> so it was even more like just taking away from me. You know, like after being restrained and then now I just got my shirt taken away from me and I'm also being bit by a dog. I was, high, I, I was very upset. I was crying. Oh. Uh, they took me to bed. I got no medical treatment for my leg. None at all. Was it enough for stitches? Do you know what? I don't remember. I remember it was bleeding a lot. I remember uh, they sit, they, I did, they didn't give me no medical help. They didn't give me gauze, a tissue, nothing to wipe up my leg. They gave me my shirt and told me that I was a black shirt. And they told us 
that it was time to go to bed. I remember. Uh, let's remind that. the audience that the owner's wife. And she didn't give you any gauze, took a look at your injury, nothing, nothing. Right, so after I got into bed, I remember trying to keep my blanket off of my leg because it was bleeding. And I sat in bed for an hour crying. Um, I asked, I waited until my uh, dorm mother, because every room had a dorm mom, which was a higher shirt. I waited until she was asleep and I asked to use the restroom because I didn't use the restroom before I went to bed, but I did it on purpose so I could get toilet paper. So she, uh, she said I could use the restroom. She was like in and out of sleep. And instead of uh, wiping myself with the toilet paper, I crumbled it up in my hand. I pulled up my pants, got back into bed, and I used the toilet paper as gauze to stop the bleeding on my leg. so sad. And yet, you couldn't even wipe yourself. Let's just remind the audience. Because I want you as the audience just to pretend that you are a student at the Circle of Hope. Just put yourself in Ashley's shoes right now. You're a kid. You are you have no other choice. You lost your rights. These people um, are delegating when you can go to the bathroom. And you have to ask permission. And then... Even there's consequences for asking permission. We'll get into that later. They give you, what, four squares of toilet paper? Yes. Yeah, so when you use the restroom, there's no doors on the restroom. Not at all whatsoever. No doors, no privacy. Uh, they watch you use the restroom. They're standing right there. Like, and it reminds you, okay, like, especially for the viewers, uh, you're in this little bitty bathroom. It's literally the toilet and a sink. And the sink is literally touching your leg as you're sitting on the toilet. And they're standing right next to you in the doorway, which is, like, your leg is basically the doorway. And they're standing right there, like, right next to you. And after you use the restroom, you have to, they give you toilet paper. And you only get four squares. That's it. And don't ask for more. Because if you ask for more, you're going to get in push-up position. Or you're going to get push-ups. Or you're going to get punished in some way. Punished? We're asking for more toilet paper, basic human rights, and they have enough money to pay for toilet paper. I don't even want to hear it. They're probably even getting donations from the church. So, and as a, and as opposed to wiping yourself, you opted for saving it to help clean up your injury. Did the person that was watching you watch you do the, that? Did she question you? What happened next? No, uh, she... So after she gave my toilet paper, she just went and laid back down in bed, and she was so tired, she fell back asleep. So she, oh, didn't, she didn't see you. Well, I'm glad, because if, if they would have saw me do that, I would have got push-ups. I would have gotten in trouble for just trying to clean up my leg because there was blood all over it. <laughs> so here you are, dripping because of urination. You couldn't wipe yourself, and then... And now you're using the toilet paper. I just really want to paint a picture for the audience. Right. Afterward, we went to sleep. The next morning, um, the owner's wife asked me to fill out an incident report for my leg. And when filling out the incident report, I wasn't allowed to put that they uh, basically told the dog to attack me. I had to put on the incident report that while I was walking by, I provoked the dog and the dog bit me. Unbelievable. Okay, an incident report is supposed to be your truth. Your story, your perspective, and now these people from a darker dimension, okay, let's, if the shoe fits, let's wear it, are telling you, I get really upset with this, are now forcing you to tell a lie. Oh, Christian school you are. And no medical or no tetanus, no nothing. Yeah, I didn't get a tetanus shot for the dog. The dog could have had rabies. Um, I didn't get any medical treatment. I could have... I mean, it could have been deep enough to the point where, like, I almost bled to death because of losing too much blood. Like, it, it was crazy. The state, aren't you going to do something about this? You're doing nothing. Nothing. And I'm getting really upset with this. Is allowing girls to be neglected medically. They're malnourished. They're starving. They're being restrained. They're being tortured. And yet... There isn't anyone who is doing anything about this because school, right. the school is still open. So, go on. Sorry. I, 
I put a lot of lie on this incident report because you're not telling the truth. Right, so I did it only because I didn't want to get in trouble. So I just went ahead and just was like, what do you want me to say? Did somebody want to say it? I wrote it down. I signed it. And it, it's not truthful. What I put down is not truthful. It's not the truth. Exactly. But I said it because if not, we would get in trouble. So, I mean, it's pretty much while you're there playing a game. Right. You're just playing a game to you're make just it. To survive is what you're doing. So, um, were you forced to pray when you got up? Did you pray before food? Were girls tor tormented if they were overweight? Do you want to go into that? Uh, so, whenever we did our food, uh, our first week or our first week or two weeks there, we have to they we, they forced us to memorize verses, and we had to learn Ephesians six, Philippians four, and Psalms one nineteen. And mind you, Psalms 119 alone is 100 plus verses. I think it's like 119 or 120 verses. That we had to memorize all three of these in two weeks or we would get in trouble. Right. For, when we sit down, we would have to say Ephesians 6 every morning. And we would have to pray before breakfast. We would get our breakfast, and our breakfast was, it was not edible food at all. Uh, we got grits that are supposed to be white. These grits were yellow. They were not white. <laughs> um, the oatmeal, they looked like Rice Krispies. Like, if you were to pick up the oatmeal and just kind of pull it apart, it literally looked like Rice Krispies. And the food was not warm. It was cold. It, it, like, it was cold. Wow. I understand they do that for the black shirts. You're a black shirt at this time, right? No, it was for every shirt. For every shirt? Yeah, for every oh. shirt. Wow. It more brutally, like they would get like bologna sandwiches or salami sandwiches. I thought that too. Yeah. And that was it. It was for weeks, months at a time. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's yeah. not just a one shot oh. deal. This is an ongoing thing. And let's go back to the Bible verses. I want to touch base on this. Now, there's nothing wrong with learning Bible verses. And if you're a Christian watching this, I want you to get angry. Okay? Because this place should be closed down. And I want Christians behind me because I need, we need help. We need help. This place is demonic. And as a Christian, you should see that. When you are punishing children for not learning the Bible, for not memorizing verses, it should be a volunteer thing. Your relationship with Christ should be something that you choose. It's called freedom of choice. God wants us to choose. Now you're dictating when a child should learn a verse and, and if they don't memorize, they're punished. Severely punished, even restrained, correct? Would you be afraid? Okay, go ahead. The morning time, um, we were forced to read a Bible. And it, a certain color shirt could only read a certain chapter or a certain, like, uh, book of the Bible. They would tell us what we had to read. And if we were... They felt up, like you weren't unfit to read a certain verse in the Bible? Yeah, they told us that what? we had a certain verse in the Bible. It was crazy. This is insane. It's psychologically torturing girls. To say that you are unfit to God, to say you are unfit to read a certain verse because you don't deserve that verse, everybody, no matter what, deserves to read any part of the Bible. Deserves to be a Christian, to be called a Christian. And now they're saying, Who's a Christian? Who isn't a Christian? Are they psychic? Right. Um, what's going on over here? And even if they were psychic, right? And let's just say you were a heathen, okay? A heathen deserves to say something, a part of the Bible. And you don't know, they could turn to Christ if they read, I don't know, John, Luke, Matthew. It's just awful what they are doing psychologically and physically and spiritually. This is spiritual damage. Oh, yeah, Spirit even when you would read, like, for instance, an orange shirt could read the book of John. 
And there was one day that I was in the book of Revela Revelation. Because Revelation has always been my favorite. It talks about the end. You know, especially with all this stuff going on. Like, it just it talks about all of that. And it's just very interesting to me. Well, I got... One of the staff members walked by and saw that I was not on the book of John. So they made me get into push-up position. Put the Bible underneath my face. And I had to read my Bible on push-up position. So wow. that and why did... Why do they think that you're unfit to read the book of Revelations? They told me that that was not what I was told to read. And they said that I was being rebellious and I was being wicked and I was not listening. You're wicked because you wanted to read the book of Revelations. I <laughs> believable. Okay, Christians, wake up, people. Wake up. Listen to this girl's story because this is real. We're... We're not making this up. This is I. I was sent to a sister program called Victory Christian Academy. Um, these are independent fundamental Baptists. They are abusing girls, and it doesn't matter. Independent fundamental Baptists, what denomination, licensed, unlicensed, Christian, non-Christian, it doesn't matter. There's over a hundred thousand schools abusing our children today. We're just touching base on this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's just ri ridiculous. It's yeah. your, again, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Pretty much. I mean, anything you did, if they didn't like the way you were doing it, if they didn't like how you were doing it, I mean, it was just automatically push. And if you were like, may I please get up? And they said no, they could leave you there all day. There was uh, so many students that had to stay in push-up position all day. Wow. Like, I out all day, like, for hours for three four plus hours if you push up the bathroom and you're in this position uh, push-up position what happens they would whenever it was time for bathroom break they would let the person get up out of push-up position we would go upstairs they would get back into push-up position upstairs uh when it was their turn to use the restroom which whenever we use the restroom we had two minutes to go pee or have a bowel movement what two now they're timing you when you can urinate and have a bowel moment. Yeah, two minutes. And we weren't off in two minutes, we were in trouble. But they would have two minutes of just simple relief to use the restroom. And then as soon as they got done, they were back in push-up position until everybody else was done. And then we would walk back downstairs and they would get back into push-up position until they were told to get up. That's just awful. Okay, have you experienced either soiling yourself, urinating on yourself because you couldn't hold it in the time span? Me personally, no. I was always scared to because like we didn't get changes of clothes every single day. We got two clothes two oh. pairs of clothes a week. So we would wear a pair of clothes from Sunday to Wednesday and then we would switch our clothes and wear the other clothes from Wednesday to Saturday. And then we would have laundry day on Saturday. I heard about this. And then what if I soiled myself? I couldn't hold it anymore. I'm doing a work, a vigorous workout. I can't hold it to the next potty break. Okay. Now what? I'm soiled up myself. What happens to me? Do I have to keep wearing the same clothes? I hope you like sitting in pee because you're going to have to. And so it's, you're, obviously you're going to have to sit in it all day. And you're going to have to wear it until Wednesday. That is your clothes. That, and it's okay to hold in urine. What, how many women and men suffer from u, uh, urinary tract infections because they're holding in the urine, urination? That's one of the, one of the causes for urinary tract infections, by holding it in. Yeah, we were scared to um, tell anybody if something was wrong, if we were sick, uh, if we didn't feel good, feel if we good. had a UTI, anything, because they would take us off all foods and they would put us on chicken broth and beef broth for two weeks so that's all you would get is cold chicken broth cold beef broth for two weeks and water okay audience i want you to picture this who is it, who in the audience has had an experience with a uti a uti hurts like hell so you are going to hurt like hell as a child because if you open your mouth you're on chicken broth for two weeks. Chicken broth, beef broth, and water. So even if I open my mouth, and, and you're not going to get medication, right? 
So there's not going to be any medication to rectify the situation. So you keep shut so you can still eat because you'd rather be in pain and, and be able to eat versus being in pain because you opened your mouth, right? Now you're being tortured, you're in pain, and you're, you can only have chicken broth. Now you're starving. <laughs> now you're starving. And this also, uh, medications, okay. no medications. People that came in with uh, bipolar, depression, anxiety, um, anybody that had anything wrong with them, like me personally, um, I have cyclic vomiting syndrome, so I was taking uh, certain prescriptions for that as well as for my depression, my anxiety, and my bipolar. Um, while uh, I was there, I received nothing. Okay, I'm sorry, what syndrome? Can you repeat that syndrome? It's cyclic vomiting syndrome. Oh, okay, does that have to do with your intestines? What What's going on? It there? has to do with my stomach. For instance, y'all get, when you, everybody else gets stressed out, they get headaches. With me, it makes me sick. I have, I'll start throwing up really bad stomach pains, uh, diarrhea, like I get very sick in my stomach while oh. y'all get uh, and, and also she was telling me, the mom, that she was getting her medicine every day. Oh! And, uh, Let's remind the audience one more time. To be a Christian, <laughs> you strive to be honest and not be deceitful and to tell the truth. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're all perfect here. How many lies do you think have been thrown out so far? Unbelievable. These people are lying left and right. It's really, it's demonic. It's dark. And they're claiming to be Christians. Uh, let's talk about how you were addicted to drugs. And when someone is addicted to drugs, it's out of their control. They're being controlled. They need help. They need medical help. And what was their remedy to, to help you with the drug problem? Quit turkey? What happened? It was all in my head. I was psycho. I, was, I went into there withdrawing from meth, coke. Weed isn't that hard to get off of. I mean, nicotine. I had nicotine withdrawals. Um, I had, like, um, not being able to drink alcohol because I was an alcoholic as well. Um, just I, So I was withdrawing. And I was sweating, and I felt sick, and I was, like, shaking, and, like, I was just having mood swings, and I was trying, like, so hard to control it. And I would tell them, like, you know, like, I'm having really bad withdrawals, and they told me, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. Withdrawals are in your head. And let's just remind the audience that if you're on drugs, if you're on prescription drugs, you need to wean yourself off of them. You can't just quit cold turkey, because why? Because you can have medical compl complications to the point of death. Same thing when you're on drugs and you're using, using rec recreational drugs. You have to wean off of these drugs. Do people quit cold turkey? Yes. But you didn't have a choice in the matter, did you? No, I did not. No. And that's wrong. You should be able to have a choice. And you're a child. You're a child. You should have... You should have had medical help, and you did it. And it's really sad, and it's it's not your fault, Mom. It's the way these people had manipulated, and they are just a fraud. It's awful. And in the medical field, if you do that, our losses are taken away, because I'm in the medical field as well. Oh, you're and in the medical Oh, good. I'm glad you're in the medical field. Uh, go ahead. Any, any any decisions or choices that we would make like that, we would be punished or we would have our losses taken away quick. Right. There's a repercussion for that. And there there hasn't been a repercussion for that. There's no criminal prosecution against these people. Abuse is allowed in the United States of America. Wake up, America, because it's happening. And we need to do something about it. Keep spreading these videos. The more awareness... The more media attention, the better, because evidently no one else is helping us. No one. But if we, we get a lot of numbers and people complaining, that will make the difference. I feel like that's our only hope because authorities, we'll get into that in a minute. I'm sorry, but unless this place is closed down, you're not doing your job. Anything else that you witnessed that you want to share? Let's talk about massaging the owner 
Did you see girls massaging the owner? Yes. Yeah, okay. You would walk by for chores. I never had to do it personally, but it was usually um, a higher up shirt, like a red shirt, a blue shirt, um, somebody that was working in his office, like a secretary. Um, you would walk past the door to go outside to do chores, and you would see him sitting there. They were behind the chair, and they were rubbing his head. And I always thought that was weird, because I was like, why are they, like, rubbing his head? Like, what? So, yes, it's happened plenty of times. And there were different girls, or was it the same girl that you would see? What was happening? Different, different girls, but there was, like, two or three of them that were just basically rotating out. And let's remind the audience that there is child slavery going on here. Child labor laws are definitely not in, in effect over here. Tell, tell me, you had to do the laundry, they were doing all the cooking. You tell me in your words, what, what were the jobs? Uh, we had to cook, cooking and um, going across the street to um, the owner's houses were considered a privilege. It was privileges. And when you went across the street to the owner's house, you had to clean their entire house, do their laundry, do their dishes, basically be their maids. Um, whenever you would cook in the kitchen, you'd have to cook, and then, uh, you would only have 30 minutes to wash everything, all the trays, uh, what they cooked with, um, uh, what, like, basically everything in that kitchen had to be washed in 30 minutes. Uh, we had to go outside and fix the horse fences, had no clue how to fix the fence, but we had to go out there and fix them. Uh, we had to shovel poop, we had to, uh, go outside, um, in February, it was still kind of cold, but we would go outside and, like, rake the leaves or uh, go in uh, the brick house or the trailer house and where they would keep all of our soaps, like, all of our actual soaps. We had to go in there and, like, reorganize and throw stuff away. Um, like, there was all kinds of stuff that we had to do. And did you get paid for this? No. No. Okay. So, sweatshops had a better... If you worked in a sweatshop, you would have a better chance than... Making more money. I mean, I'm laughing, but it's really not funny. Um, sweatshops at least get paid something, and you're you're not. And I am not frowning upon hard work. I did when I was a kid, but when I worked at McDonald's, I got paid. If I if I worked for my church, I did it out of the goodness of my heart because I like the ministry. Also, when we're working, you know, like people have to understand, you know, we're barely eating. Okay, when I went in there, I was 170 pounds. When I left, I was 120. December 8th of 2014 to February 14th of 2015, I lost 50 pounds. Wow. And honestly, I was whenever I left. The lowest I ever got while I was there was 110. But they put me on double uh, portions to get my weight back up. Because I lost so much weight. So now they're making, they're force feeding you double portions to get you, because they're, God forbid, if you look like you just survived a camp, right? So they want to make it look good for the parents. So now they're double feeding you? Yes, they would double. So you would get your normal portion and then you would get this bowl, like this heaping bowl of like over, over filled of grits and oatmeal that were cold, that you had to eat on top of the food you were already getting. And I if you were talking about that, Teresa, in the medical um, field, to double up on portions, to force feed children, to to double up, shouldn't they just ease into you know, eating a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on, and plus the anxiety of everything that's going on, what's your opinion about that? They, I think they did that because they knew I was coming to pick her up. In the medical field, the repercussions of either starving a child or doubling up, you know, that can't be good for your body either. Oh, no, not, not good for your intestines, your body, or anything. And just cold food, period, is not good for your healthy, right. for your body to digest and stuff. It's unbelievable how they treated someone who is anorexic, bulimic, someone who is just losing weight just because you're so nervous and you're anxious about what's going on in this place. Who could eat? I remember they, you know, had half portions and whole portions on the place I was. I went back to a half, which means you couldn't get seconds.
because I was so afraid of vomiting. And we'll talk about that. I was afraid of eating my own vomit. Did you ever have to eat your own vomit? Did you witness someone? I witnessed people that did that. There was a girl who was eating. She didn't like the food that we were eating. She ended up, it ended up making her sick because she didn't like it. So she threw it back up and they made her eat it right back out of the bowl. Oh. <laughs> like her was in the bowl. She had to pick it up with a spoon and eat it right again out of her throw up and the food. That's awful. Of awful. awful. Let me remind the audience this place is still open. It's open, and as far as I'm concerned, it's America's fault. Oh, yeah, it's just, it was, this place is disgusting. This place is, it's horrific. And, you know, they think, oh, we're rehabilitating these, these children, and, you know, we're making a difference. But in all reality, you're just damaging them even more than what they were when they came in. And whenever they get out, you know, like... They're not persevering. They're literally getting back into drugs just to make the pain go away. They're having nightmares, being wake, you know, waking up in the middle of the night screaming because of the stuff that has happened. Like I've personally had to experience all of that getting out, and it, I still to this day have nightmares. I still to this day wake up screaming, having to like start talking about this all over again and reliving it. Honestly, these past couple nights, I haven't even been able to sleep because I've just been having nightmares about it. Do you know what I, I hear? Was going in. Go ahead. She was worse coming out than she was going in. And our goal was to put her in to get her better. But we put her in and now she was worse coming out. Thank you. Thank you. And that, uh, parents, you need to hear that. It's coming from a parent, Teresa Tucker. She is saying worse after being in this program and coming in and do you want to subject your kid to something like that you think about it think about it. don't even take a risk even if there was a one percent chance that it could happen to your child don't take the risk don't do it anything else that you want to talk about well every time they would call she would call me there was times that they would just hang up and i was like why are they hanging up and then they'll just call me back so when they called me back, they were like, oh, she was bad. She was misbehaving. Sorry. That's why we had to hang up. Because she was but, probably trying to tell the truth. Yeah, she was trying to tell me that they were starving her and that they were doing things to her and they were uh, everything that was going on in there. She was t trying to tell me that, but they would hang up on her. So the second call, because we only got two calls, the second call, they finally, um, she said, Mom, start, I mean, I'm losing weight is what she said. And when she said that, they hung up on her. That gave me the red flag. Oh, so God. Went and got her. Well, oh, that's happened. awesome. So, so how long were you in there before mom came? I was there for three months. But on the second phone call, she said, I told her, I was like, I'm starving. Or I said, no, I was like, I'm losing weight. And she picked up the phone and she said, Ashley, we, we're not talking about that. That's not truthful. You're on door, double portions. She told me that we weren't allowed to talk about that and that we were, um, like, because they monitored our phone calls. Sure. Yeah, so they she hung up. She said, uh, we're not talking about that. That's not truthful. Uh, we're going to call her back, but that's not what we're talking about. And I said, yes, ma'am. And then my mom called back, and it got back on the phone. And my mom said, hello. And I was like, mom, they're starving me. I'm losing weight. I'm starving. I'm starving. Good and for you. I finally just started screaming it. And do you know how many kids are so scared at that point? Because right now you're at the stage of, you're on black shirt. You have nothing to lose. Let's remind the audience that there's a hierarchy level in this place. And the higher you go, the more you don't want to open up your mouth because you don't want to lose your ranking. You had nothing to lose. You didn't care. You've already been tortured. You're already at the bottom. What do you have to lose? Past the orange shirt while I was there. Never. I was either orange or black. And then after black, I would go back to orange and then back to black. Just orange and black were the only colors I ever got to. And I mean, the best part for me was I was a single mom, so it wasn't that I could just take off to go get her. So I think it was like a Wednesday or a Thursday. So I couldn't go get her till that Saturday. Wow. So um, he would not let me. He, he didn't want me to come get her that day. And I'm like, no, I will be there Saturday morning. And me and my next-door neighbor went, because she went with me, because I didn't know how to get there, went and got her that morning. 
And when we walked in, the pee and the sour and all that smell just hit us in the face. <gasps> I next sure to told Ashley because he would not release her to us until she signed papers. And um, my next door neighbor just told her um, physically, just do what do what the hell he wants and let's get out of here. With her exact word. Oh my God, I'm surprised that you didn't even have to call the police department because another student was actually held hostage, right? And they had to call the police, which means that's documented from the police, and we're going to get into the police in just a second, had to escort the parents on the property so he could they could get they can get the child out and it, it's unbelievable it, you they should be able to release a child at any given time my guess is is because they were paying a lot of of money were you you're a single mom could you even afford this you're on a sliding scale so maybe you weren't paying as much i wasn't no, you yeah. were bingo that's why you were able to go pick up your daughter without the police department but even then, after a week later, I called I called CPS, I called Humansville Police, and they wouldn't help me. They said there's nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. There's some serious money going into these camps. Serious. And I call them camps because if you listen to her story, it does sound like a torture camp here in America. You know, are we allowed to have schools like this open today? You'd be on the news. But because this is a private institution, a religious organization, somehow it could slide. But again, religious, non-religious, license, unlicensed is still happening today. We need the state to regulate. Were you able to even make a report? They said there was nothing we can do. You have a right to make a police report, correct? Yes, I would. But with us being in Texas, because, I mean, once we left, we just left. So it was a week later. So when I contacted them, um, CPS said that they were going to go investigate. But, of course, the girls aren't going to talk because, one, they're not going to take them out and keep them out. And if they do talk, they're going to be punished and put exactly. in a uh, push-up position or whatever the pressure point position is or whatever. So they're not going to talk. So um, they, could, they weren't able to talk. And I guess... As well, I was told by them that they were also um, telling the parents not to talk to CPS or allow CPS to talk to her kids as well. So, therefore, CPS was couldn't do anything and wouldn't do anything. But there are also survivors that have made reports getting, after getting out of this place. There have been numerous reports. Christina Larson. I don't know if you know her or not, but they actually had to get her out with the police because they weren't giving up their daughter. That's crazy. They it was not mine because I spoke to Humansville Police Department and they would do nothing for me. Nothing. Okay, nothing. somebody needs to do something. Right. Okay. Somebody needs to step up to the plate and have some integrity. As far as I'm concerned, the authorities do not have integrity because if you did, this place would not be open today in Humansville, Missouri, abusing children. And un unfortunately, there's agape that's still open. It's all, an all-boys program. Is that correct, agape? Yes, yes, it is. It's still open today. And it should be shut down. These places rebrand themselves, too, by the way. So if they get, you can't just give them a slap on the wrist. Because what happens when you give them a slap on the wrist, they just rebrand and up comes another school. There right. needs to be some serious repercussions. We don't give them permission to do this stuff to our kids. So. Right. We're not allowed to do this in the privacy of our own home as a parent. Right. You'd be on the six o'clock news. Right. It could be internet it could go international. But when it comes to private institutions that are making money, the sky is the limit. I was told they were a religious identity, they don't go by the original government laws. They have other laws they go by. I believe in religious freedom, but we didn't give you a right to abuse our children. Right. We need to make changes. You get out after three months, and let's remind the audience, I don't care if you're in this place for a week, two weeks, a day, it is still psychologically, spiritually 
damaging, physically damaging to a child. And I'm so sorry that you went through this, Ashley. And then as a parent, Teresa, thank you so much for standing by your daughter and standing by us survivors because we really need parents like you to come forth. I feel that if a parent tells their story, it has more clout. And a lot of these owners will train parents to think, well, they're just manipulating. You know, they already know the game. They're, they're, they're saying the child is just manipulating. They're liars. They're using the fact that they're troubled teens as a, a way to get away with child abuse. That was actually my exit report. Uh, my exit report, if you read it, it literally says um, Ashley wanted to leave due to the fact that she wanted to go back to doing drugs and go back to doing all the things she wanted to do and she's very manipulative and they use manipulative several times in my report she's manipulative she's manipulative and it was just over and over and over and over again i i remember uh, the preacher that abused us kept telling us we're liars we're manipulators we're rebellious over and over and over again until we believed it ourselves and a lot of times survivors don't come forth to tell the truth because they're so afraid it almost that voice just is in their head and their subconscious mind playing like a broken recording it, like a broken record it's like a recording going on over and over again that that, that they they're a liar they're a faker they're not telling the truth right and it's sad it's like it's almost like the perfect plan for them because they're brainwashing. Did you feel brainwashed, or do you think because after three months of being in this place, you knew what was right, what was wrong, and you were going to fight? I felt like they were attempting to brainwash me, but I'm very, um, I'm very hard-headed. I'm very stubborn, and yeah. I'm very. <laughs> That's good. Um, so as they're trying to brainwash me, I'm, I'm pushing back, I'm fighting back slowly, but surely just trying my hardest. And then, like I said, once I, I, I saw that opportunity and like you said, I had nothing to lose. It was either they're going to restrain me, which they already did that. They're going to put me in push up position for hours. They've already done that. They're going to take my food away. They've already done that. Like basically everything they're going to do to me, they've already done. So it was like, what more possibly worse could you have, could you do to me? You stripped me of my identity. You stripped me of who I was, of who I was supposed to be. I felt like I was nothing. I felt like I would never have this opportunity. I would never have a voice. And that's what they took from me. And so I just felt like I had nothing to lose. So I fought. I was not going to give in. I was not going to bow down to their every, like, no, I fought. Because I knew what I stand for. I know who I am as a person. And I know exactly what I was going to be. So I fought. For Which I encourage every other girl to do. I encourage every other person, just fight. Let me ask you a question. When you got out, the after effects, I understand that you quit cold turkey with the drugs. Did you get back into it after after this Circle of Hope Girls Ranch, what exactly happened? When I got out of Circle of Girls, uh, the Circle of Hope, for a week, I was trying. No, I don't even think it was a week. It was like a couple of days afterwards. The tra the trauma that they put on me was so bad. I didn't know how to heal from it. I didn't know how to cope with it. I didn't know what to do. I was very I, like I said. I was worse coming out than what I was when I came in. And I had all this other stuff that was on me as well. And it was just way too much. I got back into drugs because I needed that release. I had to have it. It was like, if not, I felt like I was going to take my own life. Like, that's how bad this place is. To the point where I feel like I have to kill myself just to escape. But I didn't do that. So I got back on drugs. I um, ended up running away from home. Um, it was the first week of... I think it was April 4th, um, almost two months after I got out. It was I was dealing with way too much. The stress of Circle of Hope was on me. I didn't know what else to do. I was back on drugs. I was just, I mean, so much was going through my mind. I actually ran away from home. And if you Google my name for Walks of 
people actually find me as a missing person for a week. Did you try to tell mom what happened in this place? She already, she already heard you saying that they're starving you. So she knew something was going on enough to pull you out. So she had an idea. Did you fess up with the rest of it or what happened? I, I told her what I, what I could. Um, I didn't really get into details because it was too traumatic having to talk about uh, you know, all the physical, all the emotional, all the sexual, everything that happened to me. Um, it was way too much for me to talk about. Um, after a week with her trying to contact CPS and the police and trying to, um, you know, have something done and nothing was being done, I felt like, you know, nobody cared at that point i felt like you know i was just like that was it i was just another victim and that's all i'm ever going to be and um i tried to just stay on drugs to just forget about it after a while it overwhelmed me so i ended up running away um when i was missing for a whole week and i got back um i ran out of money so i decided to come back um running away apparently is a lot more than i think it was <laughs> um, <laughs> it's more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Um, I got back, and, um, like, the sheriffs got involved. Um, they ended up talking to me about running away and, like, how I'm, you know, not allowed to do that. And then just after all of that, um, I mean, there was just more and more stuff in my life that kept happening. Um, and I've never been able to actually, even to this day, I mean, it's five years later, I've never been able to heal from what happened. I've never been able to accept what happened. I've never been able to come from what happened. The only thing I ever did was when I got pregnant with my daughter, I have a three-year-old, um, I just blocked it out. And I was just like, you know, I can't think about this no more. I just have to block it all out. So I blocked it out. I got sober. I turned my entire life around. Um, I went to college, and I did all this because I was pregnant with my daughter, and I knew my daughter, just because I was a victim to something, my daughter still had to have a life, and I still had to make sure my daughter had her life, so I had to turn my entire life around for her. Wow, she really empowered you. Oh, yeah, she's, she I love her. empowered daughter. you. Yes, I love my daughter. My daughter is my best friend. She's your angel. Oh, yeah, I That's tell everybody, crazy. my daughter saved my life. That's my daughter completely saved my life. I'm so happy. And then, of course, that mended relationship with uh, with mom, the daughter. Uh, yeah, we still had, I mean, whenever I had my daughter, um, it, we were fine. Uh, before, I had a lot of um, anger with my mother because of this, because of leaving Circle of Hope for the longest, you know, I know it's not her fault now, but at the time, I mean, I was going, I was just a hundred miles an hour because there was it's so hard. much, you know, like I hated my mom. I hated my pastor and my pastor's wife. To this day, I still am not able to forgive my pastor or his wife. I'm not able to, um, just because of everything that happened while it was there. Um, and there was a couple of times that my mom, you know, she, like, she felt bad for sending me and she was like, maybe I should just go get Ashley. And they're like, no, leave her in there. It's good for her. But oh they had God. that I was being abused, you know. So I hated them for making those comments. And uh, eventually, after my daughter, I was able to finally say, you know what? Like, this wasn't my mom's fault. My mom had no clue. She didn't even take me down there. Because if she would have walked in that place and saw that, she would have said, no, uh, you're not going here. We're going to go somewhere else. It's almost like your daughter melted your heart. Yeah, my daughter has taught me. <laughs> daughter's taught me patience. My daughter has taught me um, to be able to love myself again because I didn't love myself. Um, my daughter taught me everything that my mother feels growing up. I was like, "I mom, I never understand. I don't understand," and I was always so mad at her. But now my like, I have my daughter, and I'm like, "Mom, I understand. <laughs> like, I completely understand That's now." Sweet. And let me ask you this. I know you tried to block it. Did you try to get any counseling at all? At that point, Circle of Hope was supposed to be my counseling. So, oh, no. so you had a bad association to counseling. Yeah, after I left there, I was like, look, if all counseling places are going to be like this, you know, I, didn't, I know that everybody else is different. I'm not saying all counselors are horrible. People get help from counselors. 
But me personally, just by this one experience, I was not going to do that to myself again. So I just decided to block it out completely, just leave it alone, and just move forward. forward. And moving forward is good. Also, tackling the past is also good, too, to, to just dig deep and do some um, emotional cleansing. Um, what was thought about counseling together? Uh, yes, so we're actually going to start a Facebook page. Um, if you want any details, um, audience, leave them in the comments. Uh, due to mine and my mom's relationship, uh, we've had our ups, we've had our downs, and we've been able to come together through all of this. Uh, we are willing to um, help out any families that are in need um, of wanting to talk and basically becoming, you know, that counselor or that person that you can talk to. You just need an ear uh, to listen to you, you just, uh, daughters, if your parents are, you know, being too strict on you or, you know, like you feel like they're doing whatever, I mean, feel more than welcome to contact us on here. When we get our Facebook page up, we will actually leave it in the comments and y'all are more than welcome to call us, um, text us, uh, video chat with us, whatever y'all need. We are here for y'all. And there's nothing better than ex life experience. There's textbook knowledge on counseling. And then there's life experience. And you ha definitely have the experience. And I suggest that if a parent is contemplating sending their child to one of these places, whether it's a rehabilitation program, a wilderness camp, conversion therapy, boot camp for kids, school for the wayward, I suggest you getting a hold of Teresa Tucker and Ashley Tucker and talking to them about their experience. There are other alternatives. I believe that that would be the best place to start for sure. And also in the healing process for survivors that have gone through this, please visit their page. And I will go ahead and incorporate their page into a bottom ticker here. Okay. Teresa, is there anything that you can tell parents, um, the red flags, alternatives, if they are contemplating sending their child to a lockdown facility? What would you suggest if they're if they're at their wit's end? When they're there, parents, listen to the kids. Even though that you think that they're bad or they're lying to you, I thought the same as well. So listen to your kids. Um, be alert to those red flags because I was lied to by by that facility as well, and I had to actually just go in my stomach and listen to my child and go get her. It was all true. You just felt it in your gut. And I'm so glad you acted on that because that's not normal. It's not normal to be disconnected from a phone call conversation when a child is trying to tell the truth. Children should be able to, no matter what facility that they're in, be able to call 911, be able to call their parents and tell them what's going on. Right. Be and honest. Also, you know, like, a lot of them gave into the brainwashing. Don't, I'm, I can speak from experience, and don't have to go through Circle of Hope. Don't go with the brainwashing. If you, if there's stuff that is happening to you, and you get those monitored phone calls with your parents, scream it out. Scream, cry, do whatever you have to do. Even if they're hanging up the phone and they're just going to call them right back. Continue with what you're saying, but try to get it all out. Parents, if you get a phone call and they're literally screaming at you and crying at you to come get them, go get your kids. You know, I don't, I do not wish this on my enemies. I know. I don't wish going the circle of hope on anybody. Um, sorry, but it was, it, it was a horrible experience. And it, it's, it's hard and it's traumatic. And it sticks with your kids for the rest of their lives. I'm, this happened when I was 16. I am 22 years old, and I'm still crying. I'm still upset. I'm still learning how to heal. Like, parents, you need to listen to your kids. Kids, don't be terrified to talk to your parents. If you're on drugs and you need help, talk to them. It doesn't matter how mad they're going to be. It doesn't matter how upset they're going to be. If you're at a party and, you know, instead of drinking and driving, call your parents. Your parents will be there for you. My mom was very strict. I was terrified to tell my mom. But now, I tell my mother everything. I do not hold back when I talk to my mother. 
y'all need to be the same way. It will help y'all in the long run. And like I just said, I mean, y'all are in a bad place. Let your parents know. Your parents are there to help you. And they will help you. Whether they're upset, they're mad, they yell, they scream, they will help you. How can you rectify a situation if you don't put everything on the table? How can you fix something unless you lay it on the line? So that's exactly the best advice to tell kids. Lay it on the line. If you're in hell, if you're drowning, basically you're drowning when you're when you're doing drugs, it's out of your control. You need to reach for help. You need to get some help. And mom, thank you so much for being on the show and I applaud you for being so brave and telling your story too because your story counts and you know it always gets to me when a parent is, um, is supporting their child. You're awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate both of you. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about? or? Uh, so parents, please Please listen to your kids. I understand that they have lied to you. They manipulated you. They broke your heart. And you were at your wit's end and didn't know what to do. I get it. I was there too. I have been there. But does your child really deserve the torture, the mental abuse, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse that your kid could be going through right now at this facility? No kid deserves that kind of punishment. Some of the kids, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're okay, honey. Take your time. Take your time. It's coming from your heart, and that's all that matters. Some of the kids don't make it out. I got lucky that mine did. I know I've heard parents say that these people are, are great, and they wouldn't do this. I get it. I was there, too. I thought that of mine as well. Mm -hmm. And we know the things they are doing are not right. So please, I beg you to listen to your gut feeling. When your kid isn't laughing or smiling, you don't know what else to do. You know there's something wrong, so please listen to them. If they have ever hang up on you, it's because your kid's trying to tell you. What's going on in that facility? It happened to me twice. Oh. So please, if they are hanging up while you're speaking, it's not because they're being bad. So I beg you, parents, please listen to them. If your child is a circle of hope in Humansville, Missouri, I beg you, please go out there and get them right now. Oh. They are hurt in an unhumane way. Thank you. Thank you so much for being brave to, to give that wonderful message to parents and to warn them about what is going on in this place and speaking your heart. And Teresa, you're an amazing mom. Um, I don't really have parents come on the show. And when they do, it always touches my heart when I see that you genuinely care. You cared about your daughter. You just wanted the best thing for her. And you're a great testimony of what is going on in these places. And as a parent, this has more clout, I feel, because a lot of times people don't believe survivors. They're more apt to believe a parent. And please listen to Teresa. This happened to her. This happened to her child. And if you're contemplating sending your child to a rehabilitation program, a boot camp for kids, you have to pay attention to the signs. There are other alternatives. They have alternatives. Teresa and Ashley have a, have a Facebook page that they're putting together to help parents, to help survivors. And I commend you for, for what you both are doing today. I love you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much for just pouring your heart out to these parents because they need to listen. They need to listen to get these kids out because the authorities aren't doing it. So the, right. parents, the parents need to do it. Parents right. need to step up and, and take your kid out because this is what's going on. 
Thank you. You're an angel. You really are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa and Ashley, for being on the show, Pieces of Victory, and being brave enough to share your story. If you have a 1% chance that this could happen to your child in a wilderness camp, a boot camp for kids, a rehabilitation program, a conversion therapy, why would you even take that risk? My name is Janine Miller, and this is Pieces of Victory.